Um, I will let our panel moderator, Jim Costello from Real Capital Analytics, make the rest of the introductions to our great panelists. This is our private equity and investment management CEO panel. Thank you. Thank you much, Gabriel. Uh, hi, my name is Jim Costello, and uh, we're here today to talk about the private equity real estate business, and uh, particularly, we want to throw some things out there about how it works uh, with the folks here in the room, uh, with the ASO Hour members, and how you can work better with uh, these, these investment managers. Uh, joining me, uh, just going down the row, we have uh, Jonathan Schultz uh, uh, from Onyx Equities, Len O'Donnell from USAA, Mike Brennan uh, from Brennan Investment Company, and uh, uh, Jimmy Hansen from Hampshire Funds. Uh, guys, uh, why don't you all just give yourself a quick elevator pitch so that when everybody runs into the room late, into you in the room later, they know who you are. Uh, let's start, start with you, yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, my name's John Schultz, and thank you for having me here. Uh, it's been a great conference. I've been here in and out over the last few days, and the energy's been great. Uh, my firm is a regional investment management company. We uh, invest in New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Connecticut. We're a value-add private equity fund, so we buy, fix, sell. So it's very important uh, for us to understand the markets intrinsically and be in them every day. And we joint venture with large institutions, and we share, obviously, the profits, hopefully, as we move forward. I also have an REO receivership business. Uh, when the crash of Lehman and all the players we all know well, uh, that are unfortunately not you know, here anymore. The CMBS bond market uh, had lots of problems and I get appointed as receiver and REO manager and we do that in 11 states and we've transitioned over 60, 70 million square feet of product uh, in those markets. And so we have a sort of a regional East Coast business for services and we're more focused locally uh, for our investment process. Thank you. Len O'Donnell, I'm the CEO of USA Real Estate Company. Uh, thank you for, for having me here. And as I said to my fellow panelists, the rule number one is don't follow Tom Brokaw on the stage <laughs> as you look out in the room. But, but um, yeah. no, so at USA, we're, we're obviously a subsidiary of USAA, which is a $225 billion financial services company in the insurance and banking industry, as well as some uh, mutual fund products. Uh, we are the real estate arm. We do invest on behalf of the parent. Uh, and we also run a, an active investment management platform, uh, which today has about $17.5 billion under, of assets under management. Um, we're, it's a very broad platform. We do everything from whole low lending for our life insurance company affiliate, um, all the way through up uh, through core, core funds, direct investment, value add, um, opportunistic investing, predominantly through our affiliate at Square Mile. Uh, and then we have, uh, you have several um, other debt platforms in the stretch first mortgage and mezzanine business. Um, so really our, our business as, is as a direct investor and as an advisor to capital throughout the world. Um, and we're very active in across really all, spec, all sectors. Today we're, we're very heavily focused in the debt space and in development, which we can talk about more later. Uh, a little less active in the acquisition, pure acquisition business. Um, I think there's some interesting things to talk about with this group in terms of capital stack construction and things like that. So okay. look forward to it. Yeah. Mike? Okay. Well, good afternoon, SIOR. My name is Mike Brennan, and I'm co-founder and chairman of Brennan Investment Group. Um, I know a lot of you in the audience, and I think you probably know most of what we do, but we're a value-add owner and operator across the United States. We own about 28 million square feet. We uh, refounded ourselves in 2011, and I'm happy to say that the SIOR has helped us find buildings and keep buildings leased, so uh, it's good to be back. Uh, here in New York with you. Thank you. Thanks, and Jimmy. Hi, Hi Jimmy Hansen, the president and CEO of the Hampshire Companies, and I'm third generation in the real estate business. My grandfather, James E. Hansen, started in 1955, uh, past SIOR uh, president in 1965, and my uncle Pete was uh, president in the 80s. Uh, we are focused on our energy in terms of three primary asset sectors. Uh, we are a developer for reposition industrial assets. Uh, we buy existing income producing grocery anchored shopping centers on the East Coast, and we are a self storage developer uh, primarily on the I 95 corridor. We operate our platform, our investment platform, in both funds, 
program JVs, separate accounts, and one-off transactions. And our investor base ranges from domestic and foreign pension funds, foundations and endowments, family offices and high net worth individuals, and we have approximately 25 million square feet of assets under management. Okay. Well, you know, these conferences, you know, when you have panels, well, in the last couple of years, one of the co most common questions that people have been asking is sort of, it's a baseball analogy, what an in and we're in. Uh, we're not going to get into that. Uh, we may get into baseball later, but the, the thing that we're going to talk about to start about is the thing that nobody wants to talk about right now, which is politics. I think everybody's sick of it and they just want the whole thing over. However, when it is over, it's gonna, there's some potential changes in, in, the, in the wind for real estate. The Real Estate Roundtable, a uh, lobbying group for our industry, has been suggesting that real estate, in terms of tax changes in the year ahead, is uh, going to take, uh, take it on the chin. That we have uh, uh, the like-kind exchange provisions from 1031 uh, potentially out there, and also uh, promoted interests uh, for investment managers out there uh, is the type of things that they're looking at uh, changing. Guys, what's this going to do to your businesses if you know we are the scapegoats in D.C. and you know, they try and put all the burden of finding new revenue on us? And how does that interact with uh, uh, you know, the service providers and partners and some of the uh, brokerage organizations? Well, I think it's going to be a sad day for uh, developers uh, if they do away with the promoted structure because you look at the business model, the business model is you to find it, get investors to invest with us, hopefully you can produce a really good return for the investor and then we can share in a waterfall and enjoy capital gains uh, through that process through the end. What they're talking about now is, is to do away with that and so that the carried interest, that what we get for earning the development risk is ordinary income and I think that that's probably the easiest one at risk because we got lumped in with the hedge funds and they seem to be the evil people in the world and we've been lumped together with them. Yeah, uh, so, for us personally. So let's tax them and yeah. leave us alone. <laughs> right. I mean for us, we're, we're just going to make less money, right? So uh, obviously that's not what we want to happen to us day in and day out when we listen to this. but. The bottom line for me is, you know, as an entrepreneur, my whole life uh, just sort of sticking and focusing on what I do every day and, and hoping it'll all work out. Uh, you know, with all this ruckus of what's going to happen with the, you know, the carried interest, it definitely puts something in our head to monetize faster. And you know, we have a bunch of deals now up for sale that uh, we would much rather have them close before year end. Than after because it, it's it's a huge hit it's a huge hit on our. On you want to sell this year and yeah. monetize now, but is that yeah. going to impact volume next year? Are you, are you kind of borrowing from next year to sell now? No, I mean it, it's just it's just you know selling so that the event is safe for what we know today, right? Uh, you can only work with what you know, so you know we if we could sell, we'll sell now. Uh, if we can't, we're not just going to sell for the sake of selling. We're going to sell because we think it's right. And not only do we think it's right, we don't have to maybe have any issues going forward with a, a change in the tax law. You're looking so, really pensive. I'm sorry? You're looking really pensive. Well, it's just interesting. I think that, and I, I think that we've had, a, we talked about it earlier, there's been a couple of periods over the last 10 years where people rushed to sell things because we thought capital gains was going to go up or go away or whatever. And I think um, this, you know, I've started to hear a little bit about this at the year end. And frankly, you know, you, John, you're, you're ahead of the game because if you haven't thought about it by now, you're not getting it sold by the end of the year anyway, right? Um, but I think what, what's interesting to me is, and having been a developer for many years and now being on the, on the uh, institutional side, for lack of a better word, a huge part of our business is, is financing developers and, and, and being a partner and, and uh, providing capital to development activities, value add activities, things like that. So, and in those, we pay promotes and, and we want, successful developers, right? I mean, we want to pay promotes. We want you to be successful. So it makes me wonder if, in fact, this happens, and i still be interesting to see if there's a political will for it to happen, but um, if it happens, is there a shift in how we price the, the role? Is there a shift of how transactions get structured? Because you're right, it's, it's not a fundamental destruction of the structure. It just means you're going to give up 20% more in taxes sure. than you're right. giving up today. So, you know, and the the... the deals, the yields and the deals certainly can't support that, right? So is there, 
you know, how do we, is there going to be a new creative way to restructure transactions or restructure I mean, ventures? Yeah. Because it doesn't do me any good if all of my best development partners are, are, are not having the level of success I need them yeah. to have in order to have talented people and run their yeah. business and everything else. Sure. Um, and you know, so the question is how much of your business is reliant on that last 20%? Yeah. I think it's pushing people to take more risk like me. Because yeah. if I can now go do a preferred equity deal and not have a promote because I'm not gonna get the same benefit, maybe I will lever up a little more yeah. if I feel I like the deal enough and not worry about the promote and not worry about the same type of partner I had in, in the past. So I think there definitely is gonna have to be some figuring out of how we do it differently. I don't know where that lands yeah. yet, but that definitely is one thing that comes to my mind. Right, and I think they prefer that, go ahead, sorry. No, I, I was just gonna say, I mean, just, you know, I sit here in defense of promoted interest. Uh, you know, it's, it's it, a lot of us do, but just so people understand what the word means. Um, so if you buy a building for 100 and you sell it for 150 and you do it 366 days after you purchase it, that capital gain is subject to. That's the promoted interest piece that we're talking about. And that capital gain is shared between the, between the plan sponsor and the operating sponsor. I would be a plan sponsor. Len would be, a, uh, I, I would be an operating sponsor. Len would be a plan sponsor. So we're not talking about, we're talking about that piece, having the government characterize the piece that we get, that asymmetrical piece, as, as a fee, rather than what it really is, is capital gains. Yeah. So the, the, the other thing is that, that there was bipart you saw in the election, there was bipartisan support in the debate to, at least on its face, to eliminate it. But the truth is, being a member of Real Estate Roundtable, that there's bipartisan support for taking, you know, all of the, uh, you know, all of the uh, interest that hedge funds and real estate people provide um, and all the lobbying efforts towards it. And so if it was going to fall, uh, you would have thought it would have fell in seven or eight years ago. And especially you would have thought it would fall in 2008 and 9. And, and to what, what Len was saying too. So, so I think that, you know, it's, um, it, it can defend itself, I think, a little bit better than people think. And I think the last thing is that when, we start, when I started in the business, there was no private equity shops you could go to to get, you know, 10 million, 50 million in equity. You had to call some rich industrialist. You had a doctor. You had to find some high net worth person. Now there's 200 people you can call. And entrepreneurs like yourself and myself could get into business because that was available. And so I think it's a job destruction issue as well. So, you know, I hope, um, I, I hope that uh, an equitable arrangement prevails. And uh, so, but uh, I know it's everybody's scapegoat, but I don't think it ought to be. Of course, that we make less money if they do away with carried interest. On the flip side, the 1031 exchange, I think that has a different market uh, risk. And one of it is, is that it helps to facilitate transactions, particularly with private investors. If you take that off the table, a large proportion of deal volume may just go with it. Because uh, the advantage is you can take Uncle Sam's money and roll it into another investment. If you don't have that advantage anymore, a private investor may say, well, I'm just not going to sell and the volume may go down as a result because if I'm going to pay taxes and we get less return, I just will keep this asset. So I think that's something that has a more rippling effect, particularly around smaller transactions where private investors play. Yeah, I, I think that's the main, you know, for this audience in particular, I think that's the issue is you're going to see a diminution of transaction volume mm -hmm. and, um, and I think that it cuts deeper, right? If the political will is to go after the quote unquote fat cats on Wall Street, I think you're hitting a lot more than that if you take away the 1031. You're hitting local, you know, small entrepreneurs, local business operators, you know, the guy who has a tile business and sells his warehouse to get a different warehouse. I mean, there's all sorts of volume that, that gets hit I think that's a profound but, impact. But, but, yeah, profound. but if you were, if, if I, just for the sake of arguing, if I were to take the other side of it, how many other industries um, have a 1031 like-kind exchange advantage? Oh, others do. I mean, it's not just real estate, uh, aircraft leasing, right. uh, okay. uh, farms, uh, right. equipment, right. you know, uh, um, forklifts, whatever. It's, yeah. it's, it's a wide range. You capitalized. can't do a, a stock for stock exchange is not one, though. No. no. That gets taxed. So, I, you know, so I, you know, to me, it, it I, I, could, I could point out the dangers of 1031s as well. 
it seems that's a, that's a deferral. You're getting to, you're actually, you're just buying another piece of real estate and you're selling one. I mean, if there ever was a, a time in, and you're reinvesting those proceeds into another deal, that's a taxable transaction. Now, it's maybe not popular to say that, but I think it's, you know, I mean, if I were to want to be argumentative about it, I would say that now that is a sale that got reinvested. Um, and I think that's... No, I don't think there's anybody suggesting it's yeah. not a sale and it's not taxable. It's just deferral. Deferral so that is the issue. If, yeah. you, if you pay the tax today, you're sucking yeah. that capital out of the, out of the economy. Right? That, that, right. That, econ that capital is coming out of the economy and not getting reinvested. Reduce the proceeds available for that new transaction. That business that wants to grow doesn't have that capital available for its growth plan. Yeah. It's an, it, whether, we, whether you like it or not, that's just a fact. It's, it's, it's less capital. You're sucking capital out of the system. So, yeah, right. yeah. yeah, I agree. Right. But kind of summarizing everything I've heard from you folks here, the, the, uh, Mike, you, I think you uh, had the, one of the things uh, right on the head. Hopefully it doesn't get as bad as some of the fears uh, that are out there. But if things do go bad, the thing that is going to be the most impactful probably for the audience would be anything that happens on 1031. Mm -hmm. that, that's the, that's the big challenge. Yeah. Yeah. But it would lead to, if it did happen, it would lead to lower volume. But talking about volume, kind of shifting gears to the fundamentals of the market, uh, you know, we are in a state now where prices are at a record high for a lot of commercial real estate assets. We still have some decent rent growth. There's still demand out there. Uh, and while job growth is not robust, it's still positive every month. So how do you guys feel about the cycle where we're at? Is right now a good time to buy? I mean, I personally, in the suburban markets, don't think the prices are high. I think in the cities and certain markets that have great employment growth and you know, the growth of technology and all this vibrant uh, you know, change in our economy, I, I would say, yes, prices are high. But in suburban markets, I, I actually think the buyer pools are less it's tougher to get a loan, and it's actually harder to transact than I've ever seen in my 25 years starting as a broker uh, in real estate. And I believe that uh, with all the regulations that are coming to bear on, in 2017, uh, with banking, I mean, in what, what a regional bank has to go through today to actually survive. Uh, and when they said they didn't want, you know, the too big to fail to, to happen, it's like, the, the rules are creating it actually that to, to me happen faster. And I think it's just, it's, it's, it's a tough environment actually. Uh, when we put something on the market for sale, the buyer pools are less. Uh, the offers are with people that actually don't have the same credibility we've seen over the years. And uh, you know, it's good if you're a buyer. Uh, we, we actually on the other side find uh, we have less competition, but I think that's sort of the paradigm that's going on right now. Why, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. The so we way buying's been going though, there's been a huge uh, compression of yield. And as that compression has occurred across this recovery from the GFC uh, six years ago, uh, people started with certain niches and they keep moving out beyond it. And uh, so you go to the industrial market in Northern New Jersey as an example, it's been like the the favored uh, class right now today. And uh, things are trading in the fours and fives from a cap rate perspective. And uh, people then are now looking to say, well, I'll go out on the risk spectrum. Uh, and it used to be we do build the suits or we just do spec development. Now they call about build the core. And uh, investors are taking the construction financing leasing risk for a premium not much greater than where they could buy it if it was leased. And so you kind of wonder about the pricing. And if the economy goes more positive than we think and interest rates rise with it, that yield can be underwater pretty quick and values can reverse itself pretty fast. So all in all, we're defensive in terms of where we want to play and how we want to invest money today. Well, let's talk about that for a second. You know, you see some people taking on risk. You know, how do you feel about what your competitors are doing in terms of, are they taking on too much risk, do you feel? Are there things where, you, you know, each of you feel like it's time for you to pull back? Well, I, I mean, look, I think we have, definitely it's, it, we believe it's time to pull back. We have pulled back. I think for all the, you know, it's almost like the other side of the mirror from what John just said, right? So he thinks there's a buying opportunity. I think there's going to be a buying opportunity. I don't think it's there yet, but we're definitely, the bids are, on, on things are selling, uh, the bids are pulling back. I'm sure everybody in the room is seeing it. There's fewer bids, there's fewer credible bids. 
there's less financing available. The banks are pulling back dramatically, particularly in construction lending. Um, we see that all as positive in, in, in from our seat, right? Because it's it's setting the stage for us to be a, able to, to, to be a more aggressive investor as the cycle matures. That said, in the short run, short to medium run anyway, um, we're really convinced that values are gonna trend down. Existing values will trend down over the next 24 to 36 months. And, and I think it's just clear, there's, there's just for all those reasons, there's fewer bidders, there's less financing, uh, interest rates are gonna go up. Um, I mean, there's no compelling reason for values to not recede a little bit. I don't think we're looking at all at a 2007, 2008 scenario. I just think values are gonna recede from the peak. Um, by the same token, I think there is opportunity elsewhere in the capital stack, uh, preferred equity, mezzanine debt, places where you can still get return. Um, but I think um, what's, what's difficult for people to get their brain around though when you talk about this is the fundamentals in the business are still really strong. Mm -hmm. Occupancy levels are, are high, rents are growing in most markets. Um, few sector, you know, there's a few segments where there's a little bit of apartment overbuilding in a few cities. The hotel business is, is getting soft in a few places, um, in New York among them. Um, but generally speaking, the business is as healthy as it's been in years, but everything in the world is expensive. You know, look at the S&P 500, you have six consecutive quarters of deep depressed earnings and the prices keep going up, right? So it's just a really expensive environment. I think people have sort of hit the wall and it's, it's gonna to start to recede a little Jim, bit. Well, there, Mike. Jim, yeah, here's what, here's what happens. You know, when I, I, I sit on a lot of panels and we all do, we tell you how cautious we are and then you'll hear an announcement about next time we're gonna buy something. So we just can't help ourselves. Um, but I, I, think, I think, you know, it's on one, you know as, as all the panelists said, I think it's on one hand and on the other. I, I mean, this is for people in the audience here uh, to lease, to sell, to advocate for people that you can get value for, and it's never been a better market. We've never had this kind of, you know, positive spread investing opportunities. You can borrow at LIBOR plus 200, a floater, and if you can't make money at, with those kinds of leverage levels and interest rates, you'll never make any money. So. All the things that you'd ever dream about as a real estate investor are present today. You know, high, at least in our business, high absorption, you know, uh, high values if you own a portfolio or a seller, right? Really cheap debt, liquidity all over the place, private equity people falling all over you to give you money. Not, I'm exaggerating, but, but there's, it's ample liquidity. So, it's Is that 2007 or 2007? <laughs> <laughs> now, okay, so now. So, so right, I mean, we should rightfully, you know, we, we, we need to rightfully try to find ways that we can take advantage of that. So in our shop, we're a value-add shop, right? and, and so we always complain that, you know, why can't, we, why can't we buy low and then sell high? Well, that's because we buy in the same market we sell, okay? So I think the opportunities in this market today for you and for us are that this market allows you to, to pull off executions that weren't possible in 2008. You couldn't buy an empty building and fill it up in nine months. You bought an empty building, it stayed empty until 2011, right? So there's different value action maneuvers that are more possible in a market like this. So, so that's a, you know, on the other hand, you know, um, if cap rates go up 50 basis points and rents go from say five, you know, to four, you know, 460, you got, a tr you got some trouble mm -hmm. on your margin, you know, so it doesn't, we're kind of, we're at a kind of a high level. So, you know, that's, that's I think the, you know, yeah. I think that if you, you know, can get in and out more quickly. I think the other thing too is that we're not concerned so much. We're, we're concerned of ways to get hurt. And it doesn't matter that we get hurt because, you know, we couldn't lease the building or somebody built more buildings. We can get hurt other ways, and we found out in the residential, we found out the hard way that residential real estate really mattered a lot. In our boardrooms at First Industrial, we never talked about residential, ever. You know, now we realize that a left hook can come out of nowhere and hit us. So today I was reading in the paper about one third of the loans that are coming due on CMBS are retail. Right. And you know, if you take a punch from retail, um, a couple of them, you can ruin your banking system, and when you, anytime you ruin our banking system, you ruin our industry. So there's kind of other threats that are, you know, that, that are kind of satellites, meteors out there, 
The one residential was a meteor that hit me. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't see it coming. Well, one follow-up question for you on all this, though. Do you agree with Len that prices are going to decline in the next couple of years? No. Yeah. I think they're no. already declining. Yeah, no. I, I would they, agree they, with they've Len. Declined I don't agree. Yeah. In the I think that I think days. the the income. <laughs> the, I think that they haven't they haven't seen enough yet of income, and to the extent that the at least and you know if you're if you're trying to sell a three cap rate and telling me how good it's going to get in five years from now, and then you're going to be a multi zillionaire because you bought it a three cap, I think you got some pr trouble. Well, if, if you, you look at a broader index, uh, so you go to the Open End is, uh, Odyssey Index, the income is running about 1% now per quarter, quarter over quarter. So if there's an adjustment of rates up, cap rate goes up by 100 basis points, that means the NOI growth has to be 25% just to stay even. Right. And so that's, that's where the inherent risk is. And uh, right. that's why I agree with Len on that side, is that it, by and large, it's been priced to perfection, and people have slowly drifted down with respect to what they're willing to pay, because we've been sucked into this low interest rate um, what environment. It, what, so it, 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 all it, any, any transaction, no, not, it's a good question. Anything that is slightly off the center of the fairway, if you have that perfectly located, perfectly leased, good credit deal, there's still a broad market. I mean, the people in the audience can tell you, I think, but, but if you're off the fairway at all, there's a really small bid group, they're, 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 they're not credible, they're, they're not sure where their capital's coming from, and, and that plus the threat of higher interest rates, it automatically leads to reduced pricing. I mean, there's, these there's, are the markets that you were talking about. Yeah, Jonathan. there's fundamentally yeah. reduced I, I, it, pricing it, across. Yeah. The, I mean, across I, the I haven't country. looked at any. Maybe there isn't in your backyard yeah. because you're in a strong industrial market, but you, you know, is absolutely we're seeing it across I, the board. All I can, I, all I know, I haven't looked at anything, read anything about it. I just know what's happening to me, and we are getting lower costs, lower prices on our buildings, purely because the buyer pool is not what it used to be. And, you know, most of them don't have a pocketbook to write their own checks, so they're always sort of cobbling together whatever money they can. Uh, but on it, the other side... Excuse me, it's not a depressed market. No. It's just not, it, it's, right. it, it's receded from the peak. Yes. It, right. It's, you know. And that's an important distinction. Falling prices does not necessarily mean 2008. No. You know, no, it doesn't and, necessarily and have to go way, in big roller coasters. And, and you don't have to be a seller if you don't like the price you end up right, with, yeah, right? Yeah. That's, you, you know, but that's... Do you think that there's a tendency, though, when I'm saying not, you know, the price, that, that I don't think prices are going to fall, and my statement is, as I look out a couple more years, unless we get shocks, I don't think it, I don't think they will because, especially for products that can produce some decent income, because we're starved for income. The first two negative interest rate deals on corporates happened two months ago. <laughs> so that says that somebody thinks that there's not enough opportunities out there. So that's why I'll take a slightly contrarian view. I'm, I'm quite aware of how highly uh, calibrated some of these deals are. But where else do you get return? So I, it, you know, where else do you get some, some yield? Um, I don't, so that's why I kind of think that um, you know, I'm not, I'm not as worried if we have, say, industrial, um, yeah. with that throwing off some decent one of, income. But. One of the areas we're neglecting is the macroeconomics. It's been a long time from the recovery. We've had this longest expansion. If there's any drop in terms of the demand side of the equation, we still have this supply coming online. Uh, if we face a recession in the next 18, 24 months, that can hurt some of the expectations that people are buying right now that they can continue to raise rents. And so I think that's when you talk about cycle and where we are in this cycle, we're at the later stages of it. Uh, Jim, I heard you talked about the baseball and are we <clears throat> the late innings of a uh, first game or is it a double header? And the, are we in the early innings of the second game? But that second game, if it is on the later side of the equation, is probably not as long a game as the first game was. You know, we're actually, because of what's going on and because like you said before, that you can actually lease your buildings at a faster pace today if you have the mm -hmm. right location. I mean, the cool thing, and I think the opportunity, is if you buy something half empty or empty at a very low basis, because you can today, most of your earning power is gonna be on how well you lease the building, and interest rates and exit caps take away less, uh, uh, you know, there's not as much effect on what you're gonna make when you underwrite a building. So, I, I, to me, that's the great opportunity right now that we are going to have sort of dysfunction for a while as things mature and you know, we have a whole nother wave of maturities coming. I think it's, you know, CMBS alone, 200 plus billion 
dollars worth of uh, loans coming due in the next 18 months that were the highest octane loans that we ever saw cast, in, at least in my life. So, you know, I think with that, there's huge opportunity. Uh, if you're local to your markets, know your tenants, it's like real estate 101. Uh, so I actually enjoy the, the change and, and, you know, we've been on an expansion. So, it, you know, we're, we live in cycles, whether we like it or not, we just gotta get ready and be prepared to act in them. So, so I agree with that. I just, I, I, my personal view is we're not quite at the buying point yet because it has, that, that, that adjustment hasn't cycled through. But I would ask you on those vacant buildings, because we, we try to do as much of that as anybody, but do you think that they're priced to the point of perfection where you've got to believe in rental growth and exit pricing that perhaps is unrealistic three years out when you start to look at them? I mean, that's been our view is we see transactions that are you, you know, priced as value, supposedly priced as opportunistic or value add, but you've got to believe rents are going to keep growing at 5% a year, and you've got to believe cap rates are still going to be 45 or 5% in 2020 or 21, and, and so, I don't so have that view. I, no, I, I right? mean, I think, I think you're right. I said it was highly calibrated. Yeah. You, know, your, uh, you know, your investment committee is going to look a little different if you start knocking rents down and putting cap rates up a little bit, and the double whammy is not pleasant, but um, what, just, you know, Consider this, though, that the most scrutinized people for their opinions of what's going to happen over the next three quarters, six quarters, nine quarters, 12 quarters are people that are in the public company sphere. Mm -hmm. They have to put out projections on same store growth. They have to put out projections on occupancy, and it's all you know, carefully followed. The same store projections for all the public companies in every sector are the highest in 2016 and in 17. Now the, the, the numbers are coming out. Your guidance for 17 is coming out. So are they, you know, and they get really penalized. If we miss rents by 1%, eh, you know, I mean, it hurts, but th those guys really get whacked. No, I, I started out by saying I think the fundamentals are great right yeah. now. This is kind of when that, that vacant yeah. building story is right. can, you, can you make money at it coming out three, four years from now? I'm not saying you can't. Yeah. I just think it's, it is, your words are great. It's fi extremely finely calibrated. Yeah. And it doesn't take a whole lot to, to flip right. you under under. Finely calibrated, right. but does it very much by property sector. That, that, that's the question. Because Mike, you were saying earlier, you were a little bit concerned about these uh, CMBS, all the retail coming through. And you know, when people are looking at some of these, you know, a lot of the retail, it's kind of suburban retail with the fringes. Are people gonna look at that? And maybe some of the empty buildings there are different than an office building, an office building, John, I mean, you've got you know, some folks looking at leasing it. What about this retail? I mean, what's the demand there? Well, malls are just going to be a disaster. I mean, I, I, I think that, and I'm not going to say a percentage, but, you know, if you just look at the earnings of the large department stores and where they've gone, which is completely down, some 60, 70, 80 percent, to where Amazon's gone 100 percent up, and you know we're, the demographics, the from Gen Y millennials to Gen Z. I mean, to me, retail has changed forever, uh, and we're all going to start figuring that out over the next five years when it comes to real estate. Uh, if you look at any retailer out there, they're trying to figure out how bricks and mortar now can, you know, interact with uh, online commerce. And I've never seen more of a focus. So I think there's going to be a lot of retro, you know, changing of, of facilities and retail over the next five years, especially the mall business. Uh, but yeah, I think it's going to be an issue. And, and Jimmy, it's interesting because uh, we're a net buyer on uh, retail. Yeah. Now, retail is a broad asset sector, so we narrow it down. It's infill, grocery, anchored shopping centers. That's right. where we are placing a lot of money today. Uh, we're raising money and we're investing that money. Uh, but it's got to be the right uh, retailer, the right supermarket, uh, with no bar with high barriers to uh, competition, not a lot of land available for new competition to come in, uh, with a very strong market presence for that particular center. Uh, and the reason why we are investing there as a net buyer, where we're a net seller on the other sectors, is because if there is a recessionary event in the next two to three, four year horizon, uh, because of the lease structure and the fact that it is necessity-based retail allows us to bridge over that recessionary event. And so we are more defensive in nature than offensive in nature when we're looking at where we are in the cycle and how we want to invest. On the industrial side, uh, what we're seeing in the markets is something on the opposite end of the scale. People are willing to pay up for empty buildings. 
because they just there's no inventory for them to buy. Now, of course, I'm talking northern New Jersey, so it's a highly competitive market. Uh, but the, the difference between a lease building and a vacant building, if it's got any type of quality and doesn't have to be class A, it's a huge delta. Uh, I mean, a very narrow delta of what they're willing to pay at. You're talking maybe 100, 150 basis point discount. Uh, off of it from a cap rate perspective. And so from that standpoint, it's very difficult for us to find product that we're willing to take the risk at this stage of where we are in the cycle. And to Len's point, what he was talking about uh, with pro formas, you never see a bad pro forma. If you don't like what the result is, you just raise the rents in the cap rate and it looks good then. <laughs> That's why yeah. if you buy it empty, yeah. you don't have to think about any of that stuff. Right. Right. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> Lease, yeah. Unencumbered by tenants. Yeah. All right, so I want to switch uh, to another topic on sort of the issue of running a, uh, an investment management business. Uh, you know, today, the technology tools we have available compared to when SOR was founded 75 years ago, it, we're just light years ahead. Uh, you know, running a business today, I mean, we're ahead of where we were 10, five years ago. Uh, running the business, you know, these technology tools, it's a challenge to implement, but it can really increase productivity. Can you guys talk about uh, how you've implemented certain things that allow you to work better with partners, with folks outside, uh, internally, what that's done with reporting uh, and what you do and working with your clients, um, and you know, just how it's helping you grow your businesses? Okay, let's start with that. Yes, uh, the answer to your question is yes. Uh, we have used technology, we've used innovation. Um, look, the demands on our business have, have grown dramatically, right, between the consultants, the, the, the level of reporting that investors want, the level of information that investors want, the amount of effort that goes into fundraising. Um, you know, we've grown our platform from about little, little under $6 billion in 2011 to 17 and a half billion today. Um, and we've done that going from 120 people to just under 200 people, right? So that, that in order to be scalable, you've got to use technology. You have to use, um, you know, innovative techniques and I think what we've done during that period is made massive improvements in the level of reporting and the ability to slice and dice data and put data out in different ways in different forms and different formats um, and communicate with investors through, you know, through portals, through, through um, desktop presentations, um, giving investors the way they, information the way they want it. Um, the questionnaire process with consultants, which maybe some of the people in the room aren't f familiar with, but you know, an enormously time-consuming process to get investors on board. Um, you know, we've gone from 24 investors to 85 investors during that same period. So, you know, there was just, when we looked at it five years ago and, and had a vision for where we wanted to grow the business, you could not grow it just by adding more people, right? Mm -hmm. I'd have 500 people today and, and, you know, you wouldn't be able to be as efficient as you are. Um, by the same token, I think it's fantastic. Right, I mean, just the ability, the, the way, what it does is it makes me better at my job at the same time because all that information I provide to investors is available to me at, you know, at, the, at my fingertips. I can pull up my iPhone and see every property in our portfolio. I can pull up the business plan we have on every single asset, but just sitting on my iPhone, right? And so now we can, you know, provide that same information to our investors. And so, yeah, it was a significant investment in technology, but it's completely scalable. And um, I think it's kind of exciting and I think for, you know, the folks in the room, the more informed the investor is, the better the flow of information is in the industry. Your firm, right, you know, uh, providing data that 25 years ago, you know, how would you pull comps together, right? We were all brokers yeah. at one point. Right? How did you pull comps together 30 years ago when I was a broker in Washington, D.C.? It was, you know, make 10 phone calls and hope people right. told you the truth, right? Now it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, and now it's so much data available to us, and so it's a question of how to use the data and how to be efficient with it. Yeah, for yeah. me, there's two reasons why you have to be all in, and I could never have started my brokerage company in 90 if CoStar did not exist, because everybody at the larger firms were selling information as their secret sauce, and for me to be an entrepreneur and start my own thing, I could not afford to actually do that on my own, and CoStar really did enable me to start my own business, and and flourish and but and there's been technology in our industry as time has gone on and we've all used it as much as we possibly can to be efficient real estate's a very heavily transaction oriented business lots of data so i think the big data you know being able to see your data and understand your data it is so much better and easier today than you could five years ago it's staggering and i think our industry is actually adopting it 
But we have no choice, because if you look at the demographic of who's gonna be working with us and actually taking over our companies over the next 25 years, it's an entirely different person. And they're born with a cell phone in their hand. Uh, social media and how they live their personal lives are way different than, you know, at least personally I did. And I think that it's pushing us, actually, to get out of the dark ages and into a, a, a 21st century sort of view of what real estate can be. You know, it's a $15 trillion industry, it's huge, and it's been the last to usually adopt anything new, right? It's, uh, it's been sort of behind the time. So I'm excited about it. We've retooled our company from top to bottom, not just with investment management, but in every single division and connected all those divisions so people can finally collaborate. Uh, you know, one of my mantras was to never have someone ask for a piece of information to do their job from somebody, some, from somebody else at the organization that you be, should be able to access it yourself and do it yourself. And we've been on that journey for the last five years and I can't really give an ROI on what that means yet, but I know everybody's happier. Uh, well, what about, what about working with service providers, development partners outside of the company? You know, how, how have you, have, have any of you had successes there in terms of implementing yeah. systems? Well, I'll just, I'll turn this over, but I, I meant, that's a great question. I mean, one of the things we've done is our development partners, for example, we give them access to our, to our, you know, our system, our Yardi system, to be able to, you know, when they're running properties for us and stuff, you know, we, we want to be fully integrated with them. It's not perfect, depending on their capabilities, um, but, you know, again, one of the ways we can be more efficient is to not replicate the, uh, the activities of our partners, right? And so by giving them access to the same systems, and then, you know, in the brokerage community, I think the whole process is just so much more efficient with data rooms and, right. and everything else. You can do so much more business today uh, with the brokerage community than you could before. And I think, again, it's just a matter of how do you share information and the like, so. Yeah, portal-based tech, you, you know, you have to be mobile. And if you're anything worth your salt as a technology company, there has to be a portal ability to communicate with whoever you're doing business with. It could be a broker appraiser, and if you start getting everybody in the same community working together, I think it changes the dynamic. I think there's less mistakes. Mm -hmm. I think there's more accountability. Uh, email, even though it's going to be a tool we use the rest of our lives, is the most inefficient way to communicate there is, now that we know, right? Like, you don't know till you know. So I think, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we've got a long way to go, but uh, it's exciting to see that actually you know, people my age and older are actually buying into this because uh, it's been an industry that has been very hard to make changes, especially in infrastructure. Well, I think you said it right earlier. You got the young people coming in. You kind of have to adapt. That's how I learned to text. Yep. You know, just so I can keep in touch with the analysts to see why they're not in yet. So, uh, I think Jim, from uh, brokers and service providers to us, the information just don't give us information interpret it for us. Uh, we are always required to, uh, as a fiduciary, every year we have to go through extensive valuation process, it's an audited process, we have to justify the values that we um, put in our financial statements, and not just where the, the, it went, but where is it going? Where is the market heading towards so that we either take a look at our values and write them down, or we look at the values and say maybe we can write them up and be able to justify it because the, uh, the audit firms coming in, they pound you uh, with making sure you have the backup to support it. And so uh, for us, the ones that can give us that kind of market intelligence is really critical because uh, the data is ubiquitous. You can get it from anywhere. And so the question is, where is it going? And mm -hmm. we always like those, that kind of thought. And it goes not just for the leasing side of the equation and the supply demand fundamentals, also what's going on in the transactions. Cause it's, it's funny, uh, my grandfather had an expression that market is what two people across the table shake hands to, and the second they walk out of the conference room, it's no longer market. And in real estate, we get this sense that the market is so static, but it is moving all the time. And it, there's a sense right now, as uh, we've been talking about, a pushback where the pricing is. And maybe there's some upward pressure on pricing. Not as many bids, not as much going on right now. And so uh, real estates like water will seek its own level. At, and therefore, you may want to get this price, but you're going to get that price. And so those are the things that are going on and kind of getting a sense so that you get ahead of where uh, maybe the trends are running towards. All right. We have about 10 minutes left. We were asked uh, to provide a little bit of time for questions. 
Uh, although, if you have a question, I'm not sure I could actually see, see you. you yeah. uh, it's a little bright. We do have one up, up front here. Well, uh, the question was, uh, although I could hear you, you have a great voice, really projecting well. Uh, his question was, you know, do we think that the carried interest, any changes would be retroactive or do we be moving forward? Uh, any thoughts on that, guys? Well, I, typically when they do this, it's retroactive in the year that they enact. So if it gets pushed into 2017, even though he did something in the 1Q, it would be retroactive most likely to January 1st. Yes. But I don't think it goes That's back to issue. 16. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but then again, who knows what's going to happen, right? Oh, we've got a microphone over here. We, uh, it looks like the two right up the center here. What kind of activity are y'all seeing in the capital stack for crowdfunding? Hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, I'll give you my view. I, uh, I've invested in crowdfunding companies. Uh, I've been watching them over the last five years. I think that it's evolving. It's definitely way stronger in activity this year than it was the year before and the year before. So they're actually starting to have some traction. Uh, I think, you know, regulation and regulatory wise, I think they're all trying to figure out what they are. And there's lots of those sites out there all trying to be a certain thing. And if you really just think about it, it's just syndication on a website, right? And Without you know, at the end of the day, they're just making the transaction yeah, feel yeah. more automated. And the law allowed where you know people that you couldn't get to, you just have to send out a book, mail yeah. it to them, have a number on it. So I, I think it's here to stay. It's not going anywhere. Uh, if you look at Lending Club and some of the consumer finance companies that have been very successful, even barring you know the government having issues with how they're operating and they keep changing rules and laws and regulations. It's still there. It's still thriving. Uh, I believe that it will be here to stay. It's just, you know, it's still the sort of wild west on how it operates. And, you know, nobody knows what's going to come down the pike as far as rules as it goes on. And the, the big issue is going to be you're hitting a button to now invest, right? Is, you know, like when something goes wrong with some of these deals is when we're really <laughs> going to see what this whole thing turns out to be. But, and we almost need that to happen so that it can actually progress to the next level. But I see a, Point I see of clarification, a, have you invested in the platforms or in the offerings of the I platforms? I have invested in the companies okay. of, of crowdfunding uh, operations. I've actually, we, we've worked on a couple deals for ourselves uh, that actually we didn't, we didn't really go, go forward with, but like I'm more on talking about the companies themselves. Hmm. To, you know, just some maybe real life experience on as a customer of, of a crowdfunding company. We experimented with it to see if it would be a logical supplement to our high net worth bucket. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we went into it with a considerable amount of skepticism. It was, um, it, you know, in the early, you know, let's say it was about three and a half years ago or so, or three years ago, we first tried it. And uh, theirs was a best efforts offering. We were absolutely not counting on the money showing up. Um, we would never do that. Um, but we wanted to see sort of how it worked. And um, I wasn't, um, it was, you know, it was our deal. We had done the due diligence and what, however level of due, whatever level of due diligence they wanted to do was, you know, really up to them. But I, I found it lacking uh, at the time. Um, uh, I wasn't sure that, you know, again, best efforts. They tell somebody about a deal and they hope the money comes in. So it was in its infancy then. Um, and, but it worked out fine. And, uh, but then um, we, we decided, they called us up, can we do it a second time? They said, okay, fine. And then all of a sudden, you know, the due diligence got extremely good um, at an institutional level. All the initial people were fired, or whatever, let go. And new people came in. And all of a sudden, in the third one, they now had, you know, they had committed funds. They had discretionary capital as well as they had a platform. And it got more and more sophisticated. Well, um, yeah, I so. <laughs> so, um, so I think I, I, 
I'm a member of NAREM and, and they gave, asked me to give my views on kind of where, where it might go in the future. I think that that's one of the most inefficient ways to, you know, the way we, you know, you do road shows. On the public side, I used to do road shows. And then we do, then after we did bought deals, so you didn't have to go two weeks on the road. You could do all of this stuff through technology. That, that is to say, we could, we had so much good information in our company that we could show them anything that we're interested in. And so, um, in the same way, when you, when you start a fund, right, you've got extensive amount of legal and, and travel and everything else. So it's, um, you know, as you said, um, it's, you know, this is, this is applied technology in the future. I don't think it's going to go away. You're seeing more of them. They are, you know, before they could raise enough to buy a two flat. Now they can, now they can actually buy a shopping center or an industrial complex. So they're, the, the, the amount of volume and their following has increased. So I think it's, I think you're going to see institutions are buying platforms. Inland, who's, you know, really the big behemoth of that type of capital raising, not, you know, from the high net worth, uh, feels that that would be a significant improvement to their efficiency. So I think they'll, you know, those people will probably own that technology and use it in their platform. And it's so, it's so in its infancy, like the ones I'm involved in, I think this year they each did over a couple hundred million dollars worth of transactions. But that's huge compared to like when you said when they started and they were sort of, sort of forming themselves and figuring themselves out. So it, it's definitely here to stay. It'll be interesting to see how it evolves. That was a good question and uh, one right next to you. Um, thanks. I'd like to say thanks to the panelists. You guys did a wonderful job. I don't know if this is the right forum for this question, but how are you addressing the construction costs as you're trying to forecast out the next 18 to 24 months? We're in the North Carolina market. Every time we see a project, go bid a project, the numbers just keep exponentially getting larger and uh, at a quicker pace, obviously because of supply and demand. But if you could just touch on maybe how you're addressing some of those issues. You know, we, we just did a pretty big study on, on what we've seen cost for the last five years. And definitely, you know, there's no disputing they're going up. Um, you know, I think what, what we did find is I think a lot of it has been labor driven. So it's, it does vary by market uh, because materials costs really haven't run that significantly in terms of, you know, steel and concrete and stuff because of what, because of China slowing down. So to a certain extent, it's, it's about available labor. It's not quite 2007 where people were stealing guys off your job site, you know, by offering hundred dollar bills. Um, but, it, but I think there is creep and part of it is contractors seeing an opportunity to get a piece of the pie, right? So that's just the way the business works. You know, they're hungry for business at the beginning of the cycle. Later in the cycle, they have enough business, so they're going to tell you what the price is, and they'll take the business that they can get. Um, so it's just a question of constant. For us, it's really just constant vigilance to build in enough contingency and enough growth and cost to know that you've got it covered. And um, you know, it's a it's a race to the top, um, just like pricing is to some extent. You know, um, you try to figure out what what the next price is going to be. Um, so I assume, and I haven't, we haven't done much in North Carolina, we just did a couple things in Charlotte, uh, but I would assume you've got a pretty good construction boom going on. Um, I think that, um, you know, things like tilt wall construction for industrial, you know, things that, you know, are a little easier to get your arms around than things like multifamily or residential where you have a lot of trades, uh, where that pricing is, is more flat, is more, you know, moves at a more rapid rate. I think we're having, it's a little bit easier for us and you know, we do a lot of build the suits and industrial for Amazon and others. It's a little easier to lock those things in before you start. Um, and that's really the key is just how much you can get bought out. We really are focused now with our partners and having a job be as close to you know, 80% or so build, build out, or bid out before we, uh, before we pull the trigger because that's a way to minimize surprises. So I don't know if that really answers your question, but you know. Anybody else? Any other questions out there? Let's see if we can see any of the other side of the room. <laughs> well, if uh, I can't see you because I'm blinded by the light. Uh, it, says, it says wrap, please. Oh, yeah, <laughs> so it does suddenly. Uh, well, if, uh, if you have the wit of the stairs then and you wanted a question later, uh, I'm at least easy to find. Uh, uh, the gentleman here, uh, uh, thank you all for coming. I know thank your you. time is very thank valuable. You. And uh, uh, thanks to uh, SLR to inviting us all here. Just one last question. Who's going to win the World Series? <laughs> Chicago Scott, Cubs. You, you got to go with the Cubs, right? We've got a Cub fan. Jimmy? Indians. Indians. American Indians. League fan. Mike? Well, Mike, you're from Chicago. Chicago. But, <laughs> but are you on the south side? Well, I am, but I'm a Chicago 
fans. So. Okay, so Cubs you know. and yourself? Uh, if the Yankees aren't in it, I really don't care. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there we go. <laughs>